Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Match Fit Football Podcast. Today's guest is Greg Lee. Greg, welcome to the show. Hi, it's really nice to be here. It's great to get you on. You know, we've been planning this for, for quite a while. Um, we've got you on the show. I mean, when international duty calls, sometimes things take priority. I know you were away playing last week. You were in Canada and everything that was going on there. What was international duty like and how are you feeling getting back into it, getting back to the routine of club football? Yeah, no, it was good. You know, when it, when you get the call, you always want to uh, try and answer it and go and do the best you can do if you're involved. So, yeah, getting the call, even though the games, obviously, we weren't able to qualify even before the trip. But it was a good to, to be in and around the lads and sort of build for the future and things like that. And, yeah, being involved in the games, obviously, two of them in sun, one of them in snow. So it was, uh, it was an, always an experience, but no, it was, it was good for them. See, when you go away in an international camp, you mentioned there that you couldn't really qualify. Is that building block for the what comes next? Is it putting your name on a position that you're it's yours for the next competition, the Gold Cup, etc.? Is that what the goal is when you go away in in, the, in these type of scenarios? I'd say it depends on like obviously the team and the management and things like that because it depends where the team is. Because if you're a team who's established and just perhaps like haven't qualified, been unlucky, that kind of thing. Um, for example, like Italy, they won't have to do a complete rebuild. They'd have to just sort of look at where, they, where things went wrong and, and go from there. Whereas in, in Jamaica's case, it was a case that probably were looking at more of a rebuild, especially with bringing a new manager in. Uh, it's important to sort of look to the future, look to the next four years, so to speak, for the next sort of World Cup campaign or even the Gold Cup campaign. So it was it was more focus around building uh, and more focus about how we're going to go forward and what changes are going to be in. Uh, and it was implementing that and sort of going to try and go forward, that kind of thing. Yeah. Phenomenal insight. Um, tell me about this season so far for you, you know, um, how it's going for you, what, what your goals are for the remainder of the season. Obviously, there's been a change in management at, uh, during the season there, but how have you found this season so far? Yeah, it's been, honestly, it's been, it's been, for me personally, it's been good because I've had a lot of game time. You know, I think that the things that I've lacked in the last two years has been game time you know it's, it's been important for me to make sure I can show that I'm, I can be injury free you know when you do suffer with injury you do have sort of doubts in your mind so, okay can I do this anymore can I play week in week out Saturday Tuesday especially you know Scotland and the, and the lower leagues in England it is relentless and to honestly say even from championship down it's relentless with regards to Saturday Tuesday games so the main thing for me was to stay fit and, and play as well as possible and I think I've, I've done uh, a, a decent job of that definitely of staying fit you know only missed I think two or three games for injuries and to have the three international call-ups was been massive for me as well just on a personal note so I'd say personally I've had a lot of goals for the season that I've achieved again there's, there's sort of more to come definitely want the club to stay within the league so that's something where I, if I can help that'll be massive and obviously hope the club do that it's another uh, personal goal for myself and then sort of onwards from there yeah um, phenomenal insight, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, several injuries in the past and stuff and getting this season and the three international cops and the, relent the relentlessness, I think it's a great way to put it, off the Football League, you know, the, um, the sheer amount of games, the training, the travel, etc. Um, you came up through Man City's academy, you also went out and played in, in Holland as well. What's been the difference, um, obviously Scotland on your resume too, what's the difference between the different places that you've played and what insight can you give maybe our listeners, majority of our listeners um, would be young people wanting to go pro or very young professionals starting out in their career. So what kind of advice can you give them about the different places that you've played, different scenarios, different leagues um, in terms of the relentlessness and, the, and that side of the game? What can you tell those listeners specifically about your journey? Uh, well, I've obviously played like in, started off in League One, um, and I did three, no, I did four years in League One. And <clears throat> for me, the big characteristics of League One was just how competitive it is. You know, you, you kind of it's hard, it's very difficult to predict the league uh, in League One because you just don't know who's going to be in form, who's going to be the team that's going to take it to everybody else, who's going to stay mostly injury free and be able to play their starting eleven every week. Um, you know, a lot of the times in the other leagues, for example, in Holland and in Scotland, you can sort of round about predict where who's going to be at the top because you've got two or three teams that are just far beyond the rest of the league. Um, but I'd say obviously the pace of the game as well is massive. In, in League One, League One is probably the fastest pace of game. It's just, it is literally just uh, basketball. It's forward, back, get the ball forward as fast as possible and, and try and score. And it's a very, very physical league. Holland is very different in the way that it's football first, I felt. I felt it's very like, we want to play football regardless of how 
uh, it comes up. Like if we play football and we can see the goal playing football, we're going to carry on doing the same things. They have a really good foundation in a way of like technical football. So a lot of their players are very, very technical players, which is interesting because you would assume if these players are very technical and they're you know, physically fit, I thought a lot of them should go on to the bigger things, you know, and to be fair, some of the players I've seen, like Steven Bergwijn, we played against him when we was in Holland, and I thought, yeah, this is a player who I believe can go forward. Ziyech was another one who you think these players should be at the top, top level. Uh, but I did feel that decision-making in League One in Scotland is probably better than in Holland, which is ironic because you're thinking if these players could just get the grounding of like when to pass the ball, where to pass the ball, they would be phenomenal because technically, they can do it all. It's just maybe not the grounding of like when to do it or raw. And the onus in, on England and Scotland is very much like win at all costs. You know, if that means the ball has to go back to front and we have to keep it out of our box to we defend for our lives. That's sort of what we're going to do. Whereas in Holland, it's like we want to play football. If it wins those games, brilliant. But we want to play football sort of first and foremost. A lot of the ball on the floor, playing the ball out from the back. Goalkeepers will often have the ball at their feet and be able to, you know, pass the ball as well as your centre midfield players. Um, I'd say the league's still competitive, though. Like, you know, the, a lot of the, the Dutch teams, they don't want to be in, the, in and around the relegation battle and they'll, they'll work hard. But Scotland and League One, you'd say, um, are probably the more competitive leagues. And then Scotland was interesting because you've obviously got, like, f- four or five big games a season where you're playing against your Celtics and your Rangers. And those are the games you really want to be involved in on TV against your big players. And so you want to test yourself. So they were always very, very interesting. And as a league, um, obviously the, the rivalry between Rangers and Celtic is just is mad. And like even to be in around Scotland, witnessing that as a player, uh, it's, yeah, it's, something, it's something to see. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the time in Scotland just seeing that rivalry, yeah. It's a phenomenal insight that you gave and one of the things I wanted to ask based on some of the comments you made, especially about Holland, you know, in terms of the technical play and the philosophy, so to speak, for you as a player going out there, coming up through the system in England, was there ever a clash there where you're like, I want to win, but then there was the philosophy of the club and the philosophy of how to play football and, and how do you kind of marry the two, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, at times, yeah, because my game at the time was very physical. You know, it's very like I'd get the ball and I'm going to drive with it and I'm going to try and do whatever I can. And there'd be some coaches who'd be a fan of that. The fans that I played with or with the fans of the club that I played at were a big fan of sort of my style of play of get the ball and let's try and get it forward and, and direct, so to speak, um, even from left back. Whereas the manager I had wasn't a massive fan of that. He wanted to play a lot of football through the third, two touch past the ball. So there was a bit of a clash in fairness and that's probably why I didn't play as many games as perhaps I would have liked because purely like the manager had a different idea about how he wanted to play football to how I was trying to help the team. And, and it's, it's frustrating as well, because if, if what, you know, as a player, sometimes you see things that, that just, just isn't working as well and you want to change it. But obviously it's like, do you follow the philosophy of the manager and, and or do you try and do what you believe is best for the team? And it's important to marry the two, um, like you say. So it was, there was classic times, but definitely a nice balance, especially towards the end. Speaking very generally here, is it very important then for a player to pick the club and to pick the management team that they're going to work under, so to speak, whenever they have a choice of, say, five or six clubs that are wanting their signature and want them to play? Is that one of the, an important cog for a player to, to really consider, as well as obviously location, finance, everything else? I'd say so. You know, you want to be going into a place where you believe in what the manager has to say and you believe it works well with your style as well. Because I feel like, you know, there's some players I know have gone into places and sort of thought, well, this isn't working out because it's not, we don't believe the same way. We don't believe in the same, have the same philosophy. We don't believe that the same way to, like the same path to success. So for me, it's been good, you know, this season working with someone who sort of believed in the same system that would get the team to play well and dominate games. And, and if you believe that, it's like an extra added boost. So if you have a choice, you definitely want to try and pick uh, a management team that you work with where you look and you believe in what they're, they're saying and you believe it's sort of the best way to go because then you'll fully be behind it and you'll be fully committed. One of the big things I, th- I felt for you guys this season was Tottenham away in the FA Cup. Um, obviously, you stood out in that game. That was one of the things that I noticed when doing a bit of research and watching some highlights and things like that. And I have to give a shout out to someone specific here is Dermot O'Carroll. 
Dermud um, won a league title with the team that I follow, Crusaders, in part-time Northern Irish football, and to see him standing on the touchline with Antonio Conte on the other side in an FA Cup game was kind of surreal for me. So shout out to Dermud for that one. But what was that Tottenham game like for you? Did you see that as a chance to, to stand out um, as, a, as an individual and as a team collective going to you know, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium away and playing? Is there an idea of when we're here to win? Or what, what's the mentality going into a game like that? And tell me maybe just about the memories of that game and what it meant for you to play on such a big occasion. Yeah, it's huge. It, honestly, it was massive. I mean, it's, it's interesting as well, because when you're going into the FA Cup, the idea is, of, like for every lower league team, I think, is to go, you're not going to win the competition. So going into the rounds, you don't want to stay in the rounds as long to get a big team, you know, and to get a big team away, because you want to play in the best stadiums, with big crowds against the best players. That's exactly what you want to do. And and I'm not, I mean, the team mindset was very much that we're going to go there and we'll obviously see how the game goes, but ultimately try and stop them from scoring, stop them from penetrating us and just be solid. And then we go from there. And I feel like we did an excellent job that day. You know, I feel like we kept them out. We We definitely held them up. They couldn't really break us down, which was the main aim, I think, for us. Because and, and just to work hard for each other, that was massive. I think on a personal note, uh, it was it was for me to test to to see where the level is and test yourself against the best players. Because ultimately, you you don't like don't get me wrong, you do that in League One at times, but you're not playing against the likes of BK, Mora, Doherty, you know, players who are top players and doing it at the top level. So to, to test yourself and see how how far am I off the top. And I think that everyone in the team would have thought that as well, to be just so excited to play against people of such calibre. And you're thinking, how great, how good are these players? You know, how far am I off, off that level? Um, so my main aim was just to go out there and just to show, again, what I could do. Because if that's the top level, you can really get, um, so you can really get an indication of how far you are off it or how far you, or how close you are to it. So, yeah, that was the main aim for that day. But the experience was great. The stadium is the best I think I've ever played in, to be honest. Like the stadium was, was outrageous. Um, and to be honest, as far as getting a big team, it was it was a good draw at the time because they were going through a transition period where they perhaps weren't playing the best football they've ever played. You know, there was always, I felt, when we drew them, like a, a slight chance. And we had, like I said, if you watch the game, we literally nearly did it. Um, if we just a few things would have gone right. I mean, a free kick that goes in the top bins from, from a free corner position, you're thinking like, you know, it's just, your look's not in. But um, yeah, I think that when, when we drew Tottenham, we were all quite excited and just wanted to give it everything and show what, because we can play good football at times. Mm -hmm. I felt we played very good football this season. So showing what we can do on a stage like Tottenham, yeah, as all, all the players wanted to do, I think we did that. Post game, then you've you've went there. You give a great account of yourself. You're probably happy with the performance, um, and everything that goes alongside that. Is there something in the back of your mind going, okay, I've done well here? Your confidence rises, and you and and that and that's good for the next couple of games. Or is there a drive going? I can move up the leagues here. I'm good enough. I've proven it. I just need to be seen, etc. Like, what what's the feeling post game when you've actually gave such a great account of yourself in a game like that? Um, I, oh, it depends. I think that everyone has ambitions to move up the league. You know, I don't think that anyone... Well, if you're in football and you're just happy to be where you're at, it's more likely you're not very ambitious or you're um, coming to the end of your career and you're kind of just happy to, to be where you're at, probably close to home and, and things like that. But I think for me, it was just... It was testing my level to say, OK, well, I am... I don't feel I'm too far off this pace or could I play at this level and that kind of thing. And it gives you the confidence of almost like, well, I thought I was close and I felt close or you know if, if I didn't think I was close and I've, I've found out I am quite close and it does give you that confidence especially coming back to the league because you're like well if I can defend well against this player or I can stop this player or I can get past this player then I should be able to do it um, in my own league and things like that but uh, I think it's, it either backs up your own thoughts about yourself or it can give you re like more affirmation of like okay I can do uh, more than I believe. And, and yeah, it was, I think it was, it was a sort of combination of those two things. Let's talk about how you achieve those performances then. Um, is there anything specific you do in terms of your diet, your routine, your sleep pattern, et cetera, that you feel gives you an edge that you're religiously, you know, consistent about? Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I try and do quite a few things. To be honest. I try and keep my diet similar before games. Um, a lot of like stretching and for a morning for me just keeping the body loose because I find that once I get into the season and my 
legs start to get a little bit more heavier or a little tighter, it's important to make sure that I stretch them off and make sure they're loose and, and, and can generate enough power to go. Uh, game day is all about nutrition as well, making sure I get enough uh, fuel in the body um, and make sure I get a lot <clears throat> my electrolytes, my the sugars, my uh, pro, pro, sorry, my... Um, What's it called? No. But my, yeah, basically just making sure I get all my sugars and things like ready. A pre-workout, sorry, is what I'm saying. I make sure that I'm sort of switched on because you sort of learn as you get older. I've, I've tried to learn my optimal feeding before games. So it's important to be like, okay, I want to be this amount of switched on. I want to have sort of my adrenaline to kick in sort of here. And it's important for me to remain, like you learn, remain, remain relaxed until sort of kickoff as opposed to like getting myself up for games too much. So it's just things you learn sort of over time, of like, okay, I had a, a great game then, you know, that was because I slept well or I went to bed at this time or I made sure I was hydrated enough for the game. So there's quite a few things uh, and it's definitely like a routine of like a checklist of like, okay, I've got this, this and this and I need to make sure I take this at that time. Just got into beetroot, actually. Um, Mikel Antonio gave me that, that bit of advice there for the beetroot, so I took that on board and that's really helped us as well. So just making sure I've got everything in my body sort of to believe that I can go for 90 minutes and go as hard as I can to be honest do you find that impacts your mentality going into a game if you've done everything that you know helps you in that build-up uh yeah I'd say so because you're almost like like I said for me it's all about being more relaxed and if you know you hit every uh everything you need to do before the game you fit everything there and like you're, you're sort of more relaxed like okay well I know I've done everything I need to do in preparation you know, even if I don't feel fantastic right now, I know that I've got everything in my body that I need. So come five minutes into the game, 10 minutes in the game, it'll all kick in and I'll feel fine. You know, if you don't feel it like as the as the, uh, as the the game kicks off or anything like that. So it definitely gives you more of a peace of mind. And for me, that's been the difference from this year for me than my other years. Because, you, you know, you go into games, if you haven't slept well, it can wear on your mind. You think, God, I've not slept well. I know, but the but this year has been a combination of both. It's been like, oh, I know I'm prepared. And then even when I haven't been prepared, I'm like, you know what? Muscle memory and my, my mind will click in and I'll make sure that I don't have that game where I feel tired. You know, you just got to get through it. And, you know, once you have that checklist and you take it off, if you miss one, you can be like, well, I've done everything else. So I'm sure that my body will take care of me or my, my performance will take care of itself. And just being a lot more positive, really. trying to be more positive about it. But I think that the routine definitely helps. Was that, you know, you mentioned it was something that you learnt, you know, as, as you went through your career. Was was there someone alongside to help you with that, nutritionist, sports scientists, etc.? Or was this a bit of bit of that, but also you figuring out yourself and your own body and what works for you? Um, yeah, I worked with a nutritionist in Holland. Mm -hmm. Holland's a time when I struggled with my well, I was with my weight, like it was I wasn't like with fat or anything like that. It was uh, I actually gained I just gained a lot of muscle. Uh, just at one stage and I, I needed more carbs, more protein to sort of get myself going. So when you, when I was eating the same amount of portions and training this like even harder, um, it was just, I was coming under a lot of fatigue. So I worked with the nutritionist to find out, okay, what do I need? How much of it do I need? When do I need it? Uh, and then you start to sort of, and then also things like sugars, you know, it's important to have them, but not too many and at specific times. And you sort of learn that along the way, speaking to, to the sports scientists and speaking to the, the nutritionist in Holland was very, very good with me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that just throughout, the, even things like through Aberdeen, you learn, okay, I've got like a run of games now. And then this is, when you've got a run of games, you can sort of think, okay, I'm going to do this, this, this. And then you start to sort of round it out like that way sort of thing, yeah, trial and error, I guess. We've talked about the relentlessness and, and the pace of, of football, especially in the English Football League. Um, when you do have a run of games, when you have a game Saturday, midweek Saturday, and there's a bit of travelling and stuff involved, is there anything you do different in, in a week like that? Um, I think the main thing for me is just to recover as well as possible. Because if you're, you're doing the travelling as well as playing games, it's important that you, again, stretch out your legs and make sure they ain't getting tight if they're sat on a bus for six hours or you're on a plane or whatever you're doing. I, used, uh, I actually came across, when I first went to Jamaica, someone put me onto Normatex. That was a huge thing. So if I ever feel overwhelmed or like my legs are feeling very stiff, very tired, like they haven't got any power left in them, I try and make sure a Normatex move the fluid around in my legs and make sure that I feel um, 
yeah, just your legs feel powerful enough to go and like they can, because that's a lot of my game and things like that. So it was all about trying to maximise your recovery before and after games. What you eat after games, I realise is massively important. I had a conversation the other day when I was speaking to someone and just about protein. Um, and we were speaking about what we ate after games and I just felt like if I didn't have a protein bar or a protein shake, my, I'd start to notice the difference. My legs would feel a little bit heavier as opposed to a lot more normal if I did have protein. So that's been a major thing for me, just paying attention to my body a lot more. And that's what I think has been the difference for like the last two years for myself is just sort of realizing, okay, well, I feel this today. And then sort of going back through time and being like, okay, what did I do? Reverse engineering, I guess. Yeah. Um, what did I do to feel like that? So when I've got games midweek, when I haven't got games midweek, it's probably less important. I can think about things and be like, okay, well, I've got a lot of time to recover. You want to recover fast. You don't want to do anything drastic. Like you wouldn't go and run a 10K after a game or anything like that. But you might, when you know you've got a game Tuesday, it's important to make sure you recover like as fast as possible. So yeah, I, I just make sure I hit all, again, same thing, hit all the routines, hit all the bullet points that I know that I need. Yeah. You've mentioned, you know, earlier in the conversation, you would take a pre-workout and stuff like that. And you mentioned a protein after a protein bar or whatever, after a game. Um, is there any other supplements you would incorporate into your diet that you feel help you out? Um, I started taking vitamin D because, uh, yeah, I had an issue living in Scotland where there's absolutely no sun for most of the year. <laughs> so that was a uh, sure I get vitamin D and calcium. That was another thing because if you change your diet and, because I went to, I went pescatarian at one point. I wasn't eating a lot of, at well, any meats, obviously. And sort of realising it's important to supplement your diet with everything that you need, um, vitamin-wise and mineral-wise. So that's an, that was, those are two things that I try and take. Is, and obviously multi bits and things like that. Um, my, I have um, electrolytes and things like that to try and get your salts in. These are, these are mostly for game days, but I like to do them in the week as well. Um, but yeah, mostly for game days, it'd be like getting your electrolytes in, getting your pre-workout and then getting gels for the games to give you energy. Uh, but just making sure you're hydrated and have like a balanced diet. That, that's the main things. But I've switched to a lot more proteins. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, 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 that's just for me. It could work differently for everybody. It's just sort of trialing how much better you feel. I was eating a lot of carbs when I was in Holland. And then I switched it up to eat a lot more protein. And I felt that they were burning a lot slower. I felt a lot quicker for longer. Uh, it's just about finding the balance that works for the individual really that's great insight into you know how you figured stuff out as well and I, I think we can safely write off moving up to Aberdeen when you hang up the boots and um, for your retirement plan um, based on the, <laughs> the, based on the amount of sunlight um, up a, up a beautiful Aberdeen uh, but tell me a little bit then about the mindset what what does it take what characteristics do you need to succeed as a professional footballer um, I say resilience, you know, I think that you, I think no matter who you are, you know, you, you see it even this year, like, you know, there's, there's players who are even playing Premier League football, flipping international football, who are going through tough times, mm -hmm. you know, where fans turn on them, players turn on them, and it seems like they're a bit on their own, you know, and everyone goes through their own journey. Um, it's really interesting as well, because I had, last year we were having conversations with a few people where uh, they were talking about their experiences um, and another, another lab was like up in Scotland and when you don't get along with the manager or you don't get along with uh, perhaps the team or he isn't playing you and you've moved specifically for football, it can seem a very lonely place at times. You know, so I think that resilience is like the number one thing I think that footballers need. I think it's important, again, to be adaptable because the more adaptable you are to play, the more likely you are to play. Obviously, there's players who are almost too adaptable and haven't nailed down a position. Mm -hmm. But I think that everyone looks at, like, the James Milner, for example, like, you can't get him out of the squad because he's just, he can play in a lot of places. Um, but for the mindset, i definitely say is to be open as well to, like, bettering yourself all the time. You know, I think that if you're happy with where you are now, and that's sort of you, you never want to further yourself, you'll kind of be in the same spot. And everyone can improve, everyone can get better, everyone can to kind of get that edge. Um, and especially over a season, because I find that, you know, there's a, there's a big thing for me where I was like, well, I'm starting the season very well, but I seem to fade at this stage. So it's like, why? And it was sort of, again, reverse engineering, okay, what do I do? What am I missing? What can I bring? And that was another thing that I felt like in the last few years, I've tried to get my head around and felt like I'd 
sort of, yeah, got my head around a, a lot better. Um, but it's just about asking yourself, you know, where do you want to be? Do you want to be higher? Do you want to be at the top? And and then you go from there. It's all about so you got to be motivated, um, and you definitely have to be resilient because it's going to be tests. Like no matter who you are, there's going to be constant tests, and it's just how you respond to the tests because they're definitely going to be there. It's it's phenomenal insight. And one of the things you mentioned was you fe- you used to fear a bit during the season. You had to ask why is that, and you kind of had to reverse engineer what was going on. When you're going through yeah. a tough time in your career, when things are hard for you, and when you can't sleep at night, when you're staring at the roof being just frustrated or just annoyed at something, how do you get over those hurdles to get back at it, to get back into form, to get back to where you need to be? What is there anything specific you do? Um, the main thing for me was was being, obviously when I was injured, that's that's how I would sort of look at it, my, my biggest hurdles, because, well, there was, there's more than that, but, you know, we ain't got that type of time. But there's a, like, the big hurdles for me would be, like, being injured. And you just have to, one, I feel you have to focus. When you are injured and there's nothing you can do, because there's always a stage, if you have a major injury, there's a major, there's a big stage where you can't really do a lot. You know what I mean? You'll be in maybe doing complex or something very, very light, very small, just rest and recovery. And for me, it was to focus on things outside of football, you know, realizing, and that kind of gives you the realization that football is important, but football is not life. You know, there's a lot of things that are, that are just as important, if not more important than football. And for me, that helps because when you have, you tie, when you tie your identity to football, and then things go wrong, you can find it very frustrating because you're like, well, there's the one thing that I find that is me or the one thing that like, you know, I tie myself to, uh, I can't do anymore. So then where do I go from there? Who am I sort of thing? And that's like, obviously a crisis mode kind of reaction to things. But at the same time, I think it's really important that you find other interests and other things outside of football that you are and, and you're a person as well as a footballer. Uh, and that's how I dealt with things. You know, I think that I just looked to other things and go, okay, well, you know, yeah, football is part, but I can't do that right now. What else am I good at? What else do I enjoy? What else still, you know, gives me a, a good feeling about life? Um, and that was the main thing. And then once you have an opportunity to be back doing things, it was for me like, right, you know, I can watch the game from the outside. I've watched the game from the sideline now. I can look and go, okay, what can I impart? What can I do to help this side when I get back so then it's like right well I'll be back as fast as possible so I can implement all this new wisdom that I've got from watching the game from the sideline you know because often when you're playing you aren't really critiquing too much you're just playing you know you want to play and you want to win and you're not really worried about too much whereas when you're on the sideline you obviously want your team to win but you also want to go okay well when I get back playing how will I you know, how will I be better than I was before? How will I get back in the team? How will I, what will I do that that player isn't doing? So, yeah, you, and then I, I've definitely, since I've been injured, like throwing myself into to rehab and getting back fit as fast as possible. Um, and that was a major thing for me is just sort of learning that when I, li- I like a, a map of things, I like to go, okay, well, this is where I'm at and this is where I need to be. This is what I need to do in between. And I need to fully commit so I can get to this. And that helps off the field but also on the field you know to remain fit that was another thing when I got injured it's just like okay I need to get fit but how am I going to stay fit mm-hmm. and uh yeah those are those are all sort of the things that I've sort of picked up along the way um yeah whenever you're injured you're obviously um I'm assuming and you can answer this in a sec but I'm assuming it could be frustrating because you're not playing being in and around the club being in and around training but you're not actually playing or not training correctly and you must be frustrated but when did you sort of realize that you could analyze yourself and analyze the position and figure out how to be better during the injury period? Um, speaking to a lot of various professionals, they often just say that the, being injured is the most frustrating and hardest time because they're not playing, they're not in the changing room, they're not in and around the lads as much as they normally are. Um, but from your perspective, you've talked a lot there about analysing and figuring out how to come back better. Was, th- was there a switch in a mindset at some point there? Or was that always how you've been? Um, I feel like when I, the first time I can remember doing it was when I was 16. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got injured for five months and I had, or six months, and I had an operation. And I feel like that was when, that's when I started to watch games and look and think, okay, you know, that the person who's playing on position is doing that. And they're doing it well, you know, and I don't do that as much. I guess it is frustrating 
but I think that after a while, because like I had when I was 15 or 16, I had two, I had a five month injury, a six month injury, stayed pretty much injury free until like last two years and then had two major injuries. So I feel like there's there's probably a different mindset to being out for so long. When you're out for that amount of time, it's frustrating, but you can't be frustrated for five months. You know, you can't be frustrated for six months, seven months, 10 months, even one of them. And I'm like, you know, I think that it is frustrating in not being in around the lads, but you sort of, you get used to it. It's annoying for maybe, for me anyway, it's annoying for like two, three weeks, but you sort of realise, like, this is where I'm at and you have to move forward, um, which it is annoying. Like, I'm not going to like diminish that, but at the same time, I'm just like, right, well, when I do get back, because I will, how am I going to be better? Um, and that's, again, it's just where you put your focus. You know, it's just about where you put your focus. And for me, I remember doing it, I remember very vividly doing it at 16. So when it happened again, uh, I think about, 25 when it happened again at 25 I was like okay you know less than ideal but this is an opportunity to to make sure one this injury doesn't happen again because I think that that's important as well for injuries you know learning that myself is like okay if an injury happens it's because of a reason and if you you, you need to chase and find out the reason because I've been in the predicament where I didn't chase and find out the reason and it came back to bite me so twice. <laughs> so it's definitely important, I think, to, to get to the, the, the bottom of why it happened. Um, and that, that, be, that becomes my focus now anyway. So like as much as it's annoying and I know you know you won't be around the lads as much, um, my focus becomes, OK, why did this happen? How am I going to get back from it? And how am I going to make sure it never happens again? And I guess that's just kind of how I am as a person, really, to try and get to the root of problems and make sure they don't become repeat issues. It's 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 amazing focus and focus was a word that you used there when you were you know explaining that and I think that's vital for any young players listening to this any young aspiring footballers is to be able to learn whenever you're not able to play you know some people think you can only learn when playing there's a element of learning when you're not playing and analyzing and even looking at things and you've obviously you've touched on it there and one of the things I want to touch on about learning is you were obviously in the Man City Academy at the start of your career and. Um, and Man City were beginning to build to become what they are now and some phenomenal players in there, Aguero, Silva, um, an underrated one I always felt was Mike on um, as, 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 a, <laughs> as a fullback. I could always admire Mike on. Um, for, from your perspective as a kid growing up, was there, was there anything from those players or maybe certain veterans at Man City, your companies and things like that, that you were able to take and add to your own game, maybe just from how they handled themselves or anything? Um. Yeah, I had good opportunities when I was at City as well to, to be close to some of the English-based players. So I spoke with uh, Lescott and Michael Richards quite a bit and just learned the little things about defending from them. You know, actually, it's funny, when I was at NAC, uh, Lescott was in charge of the loan players. So I would see him from time to time. We would chill and, like, hang out. He would speak to us about our game then and things like that. So just just small things on, like, defending was, was, uh, was massive. But also just um, when you train with them, you pick up little things that they do. Um, always being like, always being aware. That was a big thing because because a lot of these players, you watch them on a Saturday, you don't actually know day to day how 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 great are they, how good are they. So I was very surprised by certain players in the team because you're looking at them going, well, you know, they aren't phenomenal when they play on the weekend, but in training, like different level. I, was, I always say people will say some like we have like conversations just through like changing and stuff, and be like, oh, who's the best finisher you've seen, and who's the best touch, and who's the best at like keeping the ball and things like that and a lot of players you wouldn't thought Edin Dzeko is one of the best finishers I've ever seen in my life you know and like you look at sort of where the way he does things or, or how he sets the ball when he's going like I'm not a striker but you even looking at it going well if I'm never getting up there this is how I'd want to be company the way he defends showing people into areas of no space and making sure that he uses his body or you know gets himself in front big things like that Joel taught me like when someone goes like a one-two, tries to go one-two around you, turn into the man and push the man away as opposed to turning where the ball goes. Just small things like that, you kind of, you either pick it up or a lot of these players will have the time to just mention it to you and say, oh, this is what I've seen you do and you could maybe change it. Um, which has been, yeah, which is, which is obviously yeah, an experience that gets you a lot further. Even having a, having a good manager at City or a great manager at City was a massive thing because you learn the game when you're that young. You learn... You know the do's, the don'ts, the how the team should be, and and that kind of thing. And it, it stands you in good stead for the future. Yeah, we've well, had a phenomenal career um, so far, and excited to see where it goes. Excited to see what happens next. You know, you've 
played in a couple of different leagues, a couple of different um a couple of different clubs and things like that. Excited to see what happens next. But I have to ask one other one other question just before we wrap it up. Um, there's always that famous quote from Jamie Carragher to Gary Neville. He says, no one wants to grow up and be a Gary Neville, talking about, you know, being a fullback. But in the last number of years, especially with the emergence of, you know, Trent Alexander Arnold, Reese James, Ben Chilwell, Andy Robertson, Cancelo this season, etc., fullbacks become a very fun cool and integral part of the game do you feel that as a fullback yourself yeah honestly i find it being more of an attractive position especially the, the way it's played now i feel that it's so high and wide and you get so much of the ball that yeah it's getting a lot more respect i can't lie it's getting a lot more respect i think because you know you come from an area of like 442 this is how they play play and stay you know now you're playing with centre halves you can really handle the ball and centre midfield players are going to drop and do the defensive work and I, yeah, I think the game's just changed a lot. The game's just changed a lot. I find now, for example, I think that obviously number nine will always be a, a very attractive position, but you're finding less and less number nines in football. You know, like even Chelsea now barely play with like, they've, they've bought, you know, Lukaku and barely play with them. United are starting to play without a number nine. City play with number nine, without a number nine for a whole season. Football's just changing. So like being a fullback is becoming a little bit more attractive to people. Um, and I think that everywhere around the pitch, you, you know, you need to be technically proficient. That's another thing that is changing the game because I feel like everybody uh, who plays at the top level now is, is technically good. And to be honest, with regards to delivery and, um, you know, passing and shooting, the find that the fullbacks or the wide players are often the people who've got some of the best technique for that. But yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely changed, which is nice because you get a bit more respect for being a fullback, you know what I mean? It's it's interesting, isn't it? You know, when you look at statistics for fullbacks now, when Sky pull up in the transfer centre, you know, like different fullbacks are being linked. It's not often the the tackles or the interceptions that are listed now. It's usually the goals and the assists, and or you know yeah. the stats leading to goals. It's it's quite fascinating. I think you know we're analysing a defender for what they're contributing at the top end of the pitch now, just in terms of the yeah. analytical side of the game. I just find that absolutely fascinating, and obviously. Um, you mentioned the word delivery. I mean, it's so key for a fullback now, isn't it, to be able to put a good ball in? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's like I said, the game has just changed. The game has just changed quite substantially. I think just because if you look at the positions on the pitch, you know, and, it's, and especially the way people are playing with the, uh, you know, the playing formation now of like three five two. So a lot of these fullbacks are becoming, you know, wing backs. You know, you yeah. look at like Doherty at, uh, at Tottenham and things like that. And I think, well, he was out and out fullback, but he's now playing wing back and getting goals and getting assists because, you know, you're pushing these players further forward. The wingers becoming a little bit less of a definite thing. You know, even, I mean, even at like, for example, Man City, I think that like, yeah, you've got, you've got Mahrez, you've got Foden, but a lot, they can both play. I mean, Mahrez is a little bit more wide up. Foden can drift inside and do that side of the game and leave that space for the fullback. So I think that football is just, just changing and you need to be able to do a lot more, but at the same time, these fullbacks you've got now are all very capable. So it's just, it's, yeah, it's very interesting to see how football has progressed or will progress even further. In terms of training as a fullback, is there a lot of work and a lot of emphasis put on delivery? And in terms of yourself as a fullback, you know, you can whip a ball in, you can put a hard and low, you can drive it in. Is there a particular method that you prefer or does it depend on perhaps strikers, runners, midfielders, what, what you're seeing from your team? Um. It's been interesting because I feel like my delivery was something that I struggled with when I was uh, like younger. I think I would get in a good position and then deliver it, not not the best. So I think like I worked on that personally quite a bit because I was like, that's something that I believe I can really progress my game if I get that right. Um, but I do feel that I I personally feel that it's important to pardon me, notice what the person you're playing against is doing. You know, a lot of the time if they come and try to get the ball off you, there's a lot of space in behind them. So that would give them, you sorry, you the advantage to get past them and then you want to put the ball hard and low and in behind the defence because it's really difficult to defend. If they give you a lot of time, it's taking it out of your feet and just delivering it again. You do want to get it in behind them, but making sure that, you know, you, you deliver the ball sort of in the area of your striker. Know where your strikers, once you train with people, you know where they like to make their runs and where they want to be. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important to practice all three, you know, and, and, and read the game and see where the centre halves want to be. So important, like, is if you see them going in the position you want to cross it, you have to change up and find another way to do things. Uh, but it's a lot more instinctual and that is, you know, it's a lot more like when it comes, you know, sort of thing, as opposed to thinking about it too much beforehand. Absolutely love the use of the word instinctual. I think it's so vital in today's 
game of football you know and the type of the, the way people are playing tactics the freedom in terms of you know you talked about four four two and now everybody's everywhere and people are drifting inside and there's a lot of it's a lot more organized chaos so to speak in a in a game of football um last question for you as, as we as we close the podcast what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received um for our listeners Oof. best piece of advice that I've ever received. um I honestly, they, I can't, I can't, I, I'm honest, I can't remember something like this, but it was basically along the lines of like, if you have a, if you have a bad game, it doesn't make you like a bad player. And I think that we get wrapped up in this idea of like, whatever you do on a football pitch, it's like, people will look at that and think, well, that's the kind of player you are. And when you're having a bad time, just like, because I think there was a period where I did, I had about maybe two or three bad games in a row and thinking it's the end of the world and people are going to judge me. And I think it was a period where I needed people to, to look and want and be, be attractive and, and make sure people sort of want to take me. And it was when, you know, you have a bad game, you think, well, people think you're a bad player. But one bad game doesn't make you a bad player. And it's important that you stay positive to go, well, I'm not a bad player, you know, because ultimately there aren't many in professional football that are. So it's important that you stay sort of grounded and focused, never get too high, never get too low. And that's that's another one that uh, one of the boys was saying literally the other day, whereby you just... You take everything with a pinch of salt and you just go out there and try and do the best you can do. Because ultimately, you know, if you have a bad game, yeah, it's annoying and it's frustrating. But in football, there's always one other one around the corner, you know, and it's just to remain focused on, OK, what is my job and how am I going to do it to the best of my ability? Um, and yeah, if things are going really well for you. That's perfect. But as soon as you start going badly, don't get too low. Don't think okay this is the end of the world because ultimately everyone's been there you know we're looking at a, a moment in time where whole teams are having shockers do you know what i mean and and there's a lot of question marks over them but i'm sure that they're not looking and going well i were bad players they're just going through a rough time and everyone in football will go through a rough time but it's just to remain focused and keep that belief and that faith that yeah you are a good player and you'll get through it Phenomenal insight, um, Greg, and thank you so much for agreeing to come on the podcast and share your words of wisdom and a little bits and tidbits about your journey all the way through the show. So listen, thank you so much for coming on. You're on Instagram. Where can people find you on Instagram? Where can they follow you? See what you're up to. Oh, so Greg Lee underscore G-R-E-G-L-E-I-G-H. Perfect. There we go, folks. Give him a follow, give him a like, see what he's up to and follow his career. Greg, thank you so much for coming on the show. Wish you all the best for the rest of this season, for next season, and obviously for international duty with Jamaica as well. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. No trouble. Thanks for having me. Cheers.